So it's really interesting because these are some of the most profound, sublime verses uh, explaining the depth of, of Paul's presentation of the gospel, some of the highest theology that you can encounter in the Bible. Yet, at the same time, it is also one of the most practical things that Paul has presented here so far. And I want to try to explain that uh, today. But let me, let me give you guys kind of like a silly illustration to start off with. Let's imagine that, you know, you're in Brawley and you go to the Brawley skate park, right? And um, <clears throat> there's a bunch of guys who are skateboarding there. And let's say that they hear the gospel and they repent and believe in Jesus. And now you've got these group of skateboarders who are Christians. And, they're saying like, and they, they tell each other, hey... Uh, we're Christians now. Let's let's fellowship while we skateboard together. So they meet at the skate park every day, and they skate together, and they are telling each other uh, about the gospel and encouraging each other in their faith. And as time goes on, some of the rollerbladers at the skate park kind of get you know interested, and they say, "Hey, we want to be Christians too. Um, can we can we you know join you guys?" And the skateboarders are like, "Yeah, for sure. Like, come worship Jesus with us, and we'll we'll do this together at the skate park." And so the rollerbladers come into the skaters group, and the skateboarders hand the rollerbladers, hey, here's some skateboards for you guys. And the rollerbladers are like, okay, I guess we'll skateboard. And so they all start skateboarding and fellowshipping together. Now, as time goes on, let's say the mayor of Raleigh just got sick of the skateboarders and said, no more skateboarders are allowed at the skate park anymore. And so all the skateboarders get kicked out, and the only Christians left in the skate park are the rollerbladers, right? And so the rollerbladers, they say, well, we'll keep fellowshipping. We'll keep, you know, coming together. And, and they come together, but instead of skateboarding, they just kind of go back to their rollerblading ways, right? So they're, they're worshiping while they're rollerblading. Uh, maybe a few months pass, and a new mayor gets elected at Brawley. And this mayor is not opposed to skateboarders. And he tells the skateboarders, hey, you guys are good to come back to the skate park. You, uh, it's not a problem. You know, you can, you can come back. All the skateboarders now come back to the skate park. And the including the Christian skateboarders, right? And so the Christian skateboarders come back, and they see all the Christian rollerbladers, and they say, hey, we're back. Let's keep worshiping together. Um, you know, you know let's, let's worship Jesus and fellowship just like we used to. And uh, the skateboarders say, you know, hey, rollerbladers, get your skateboards out, and we'll, you know, fellowship like we used to. But the rollerbladers are like, wait, wait, wait. We've been worshiping just fine without the skateboards. Uh, we're going we're gonna to worship while we rollerblade and not while we skateboard. And there starts to be this, like, tension, this, this division within this, you know, Christian fellowship between the skateboarders and the rollerbladers about who gets to, you know, be in charge of the group, who gets to uh, kind of, you know, designate how the, the fellowship is done. And there's this conflict of leadership. There's this tension. There's this, this disunity in this fellowship. In, in summary... This is exactly what had happened to the church in Rome. There was a point where the gospel first came to Rome, and the first Christians in Rome were all Jewish people. They believed that Ju Jesus was the Jewish Messiah promised in the Old Testament. And so the early church, they were all Jews. And it was great. They fellowshiped together while they you know, had their kosher diets and they practiced circumcision and their Jewish culture. But as time went on, some of the non-Jews, called Gentiles, began to believe in Jesus as well. And the Jews are like, yeah, come worship Jesus with us. Uh, we'll fellowship together. And it was great. And, you know, the, the, the Gentile believers, you know, were asked to get circumcised. Hey, don't eat pork. You know, follow the Mosaic law and all that. And then at one point, the emperor of Rome, Emperor Claudius, in the year AD 49, kicked out all the Jews from Rome. Basically, if you were Jewish, you had to leave the city of Rome, including all the Christians who were of Jewish uh, ancestry. So now, the only Christians left in the city of Rome were these Gentiles, these Greeks, these non-Jewish people. And they still come together, and they still worship, and they still fellowship, but they kind of like, you know, leave behind some of the Jewish uh, customs that they had been doing previously. Five years go by. And there's a new emperor in town, and that emperor is totally fine with the Jews coming back to Rome. So he says, hey, you know, if you're Jewish and you got kicked out, you're, you're welcome to come back to the city. 
And so all the Jews come back, including the Christian ones. And the Christian Jews come back to the, the Gentile Jews and say, hey, we're back. Let's keep worshiping together. And, you know, we'll, we'll make it just like it used to be. But at that point, the Jewish Christians are like, hey, we've been, you know, running the fellowship. We've been, you know, doing our thing just fine without all the, you know, Jewish customs. And there's this tension. There's this clash between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians about how they should worship, what foods they should eat, how, whether or not they should be circumcised, to what level should they be following these, these Jewish laws. And there's conflict and there's division in the church of Rome. And Paul knows this. And his letter probably is written about three years after the Jews return to Rome. And as a result, Paul knows that if he's going to be able to, you know, connect with the church at Rome, he needs to help them through this crisis. He needs to help them through this conflict that they are experiencing in their church. And the way that he addresses it, he could just say, hey, you guys, behave. Get along together. You know, stop fighting. But instead, he goes to the gospel. He goes to the work of Jesus Christ, and he lifts it up before the Jews and the Gentiles and says, I want you to look at this, guys. I want you to dive deep into this gospel because it is going to solve this conflict that you are having. So let's, let's look at it. So in verse 21, um, we see that Paul writes this. Now... The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So remember, the Jew, Jewish Christians had come along to the Gentiles and said, hey, Gentiles, you need to listen to us Jews because we have the law of God. You know, the Ten Commandments, God gave that to us. He didn't give it to you, so you need to follow us. You need to submit to us. And Paul says, it is great to have God's word. It is great to have the law of God. This is an advantage that the Jewish people have had. But, Paul says, it's not enough to just have God's law. Like, if you want to be justified, if you want to be made right, you actually have to follow it. And Paul says, you know, trying to be righteous by having the law definitely won't work. And no one can be righteous by obeying the law, by behaving correctly. That righteousness, no one has been able to attain. But now, Paul says, there's another type of righteousness, a new type of righteousness. But the, the Bible has always talked about this other way of being righteous, being made right before God. And he says this in verse 22, that there is this uh, righteousness of God not through works, but through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So it's interesting. Remember, Paul has been comparing these two groups over the last few chapters. You know, like, yeah, you know, the Gentiles, they, they don't have God's law, but, you know, they're, they're guilty. But the Jews, even if they do have God's law, well, they don't obey it, so they're just as guilty as the people who, do, who don't have God's law. And Paul has been, like, comparing and contrasting these two groups. And his summary, of course, as we saw previously, is that everyone has sinned. No one does good. No one seeks after God. And so when Paul says here... Uh, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I think, like, typically as Christians, we kind of see this as, like, every individual is a sinner. And that's true, but that's not the main focus Paul has here in Romans when he says that all have fallen short. He's saying all types of people, all groups of people. Doesn't matter if you're Jewish, doesn't matter if you're Gentile, doesn't matter, you know, what group of people, what community you come from. Um, whether or not that community, you know, has God's law or not, all have sinned and are falling short of this glorious standard that God has put before us. So it's, it's interesting. Paul is saying there's, there is no group, there is no community of people, there's no tribe that can be justified before God based on, on their works. And, I mean, if there was one group of people who, yeah, Surely they are good enough, you know, they meet the standard that God would require. It would be the Jews because they do have God's law. And they, their whole community up at that time was just based around God's word and preserving it and memorizing it. And, you know, they even put it on their, around their doors uh, and on, on their homes. That's how central God's word was to them. But, Paul says, it's not enough. It doesn't justify anyone. 
And, and in fact, the law was almost a, 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 um, a hinder to the Jews because they thought, well, since we have the law, we're good enough. And we can look down on these Jewish people who aren't, you know, saturated in the law like we are. And they kind of look down on these other communities, these other groups. And this is, I think, the danger that we need to look out for. It's very, very easy to look at our community and say, well, because we have X, at least we're not as bad as that other group of people over there. Um, probably the most <laughs> uh, just, just vivid picture of this, um, at least in, you know, whether or not you're even a Christian, is this like subject of racism, right? And, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with celebrating, you know, if you're of Irish descent or African-American descent or, uh, you know, Brazilian descent. Like, there's nothing wrong in saying, hey, you know, I like St. Patrick's Day. I like Mardi Gras. I like, you know, such and such. There's nothing wrong with celebrating your culture. But the moment you take your ethnicity or your culture and then raise it up, to like an ultimate level saying, this is what makes me better than everyone else, then you've turned something good and okay into an idol. And it's so funny that the communities who do that type of thing very often just kind of make that standard higher and higher. Um, there's, a, there's a TV show called Community. And the whole premise is that these the different people from different backgrounds of life go back to community college to, you know, kind of get their lives back on track. And uh, one of the characters, the students at this school, uh, is played by Chevy Chase, right? And um, one day he wants to introduce his father to all his friends who are part of this community group. And uh, his father is like, Super racist, right? And, um, and, and Chevy Chase is trying to introduce him to his friends who um, there's just, you know, different backgrounds. And uh, his father uh, walks in and sees all the people in, in Chevy Chase's uh, uh, study group. And he looks at him and says, are these your friends, minorities? And, uh, <laughs> and, and there's this, like, kind of like feminist activist, like, uh, girl in the group. And she, like, she gets mad, and she says to him, how dare you? That is inappropriate. And maybe you'll take that a little bit more seriously since I'm white. And he looks at her and says, hmm, you've got a wide brow. What are you, Scandinavian? And she's all, yeah, I'm, I'm Swedish. <laughs> Swedish dog, your blood has been tainted from generations of race mixing with uh, Laplanders. You're basically from Finland. And the whole, the whole point of this, you know, interchange is that you would think, like, okay, they're both, like, white, so they're, like, he would think, like, hey, we're on the same team, right? But in reality, the, the standard that we measure ourselves, we can always close that circle a little bit tighter and exclude more and more people. And this is, I think, what communities tend to do, because in community, we tend to find ourselves. We find our identity. We get a sense of purpose. We have a sense of uh, support. And, we, and uh, without the gospel, we tend to say, you know, the thing that makes our community better than the next community, you know, we got we to gotta lift that high. We have to boast about it. We have to make it everything. And this is the, the human nature of, of community is that there always needs to be essentially something that says, hey, the difference between good that we have and the evil around us is this line. And for the Jews, it was the law of God. They said, because we have the law, at least we're not as bad as the next people. But it's so funny, in the Bible, the Jews kind of do the same thing. They not only are like um, separating themselves from the non-Jewish Gentiles, but we see in the Gospel of John that even like the Jewish religious leaders kind of separate themselves from the Jewish uh, Average Joe guy, right? So in John 7, 48, uh, a lot of the people are seeing Jesus' ministry, and they're like, wow, Jesus is great. And all the religious leaders, the, the Jewish uh, authorities, basically mock all the people who are saying that, hey, Jesus might be the Christ. Jesus might be the prophet. And here's what they say about those people who believe that Jesus is the Christ. They ask, hey, have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in Jesus? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. You've basically got the Jewish authorities looking at the Jewish people and saying, you guys don't know the law as well as we do. You guys are cursed. You guys are separated. 
And this is, the, this is the danger about community, is that we can always make our circle smaller and say, well, you're not really in the know. You're not really part of that inner circle. And, and it, <laughs> we have to recognize who is speaking in this passage. Paul himself is a Jew, and he does not hide that fact at all. But he is speaking, and he's pushing back against his own tribe, his own community, the Jews who have exalted themselves based on the law. And I think this is such a good model for us. I think this is so healthy because we see, you know, in politics and in other areas that if somebody else's tribe, if somebody else's community does something wrong that you're opposed to, man, your, your community will lift up that problem. Like, look how bad that tribe is. Look how bad that political party is. Look how bad they screwed up. But if someone in our own tribe screws up, we say, well, you know, his intentions were good. Well, you know, you know, we all make mistakes. They, we, we tend to suppress it. But Paul doesn't fall into that trap. He looks at his own tribe, his own people, and says, hey, we screwed up. There is someone who's part of our, our tribe, part of our group, who has not done what is right. And this is the test, I think, of uh, a, a community centered on the gospel versus a community that has been centered on something other than Jesus is that we are unafraid uh, as, as Christians to say, I'm the screw-up. Our tribe has screwed up. Our tribe has messed up. And that's one of my favorite things about our services on Sunday is every week we take time to call out our own sins in confession. Um, it, I think it's so easy for even Christians to say, God, look how bad the world is. But our posture here at Gateway is that each week we take time to confess our own shortcomings. Each week we take time to, show, to, to declare to one another, Father, we've sinned. Jesus, help us. Have mercy on us. We confess. That is, we are willing to focus more on our own sin, our own shortcomings, than we are to make a big deal out of the failures of those who are not in our tribe. And Paul models this beautifully here in this passage. So let me, let me apply this. Maybe uh, I wonder how many maybe high school students we have here. I want to encourage you, be aware of your tribe. Be aware of your community. In other words, if you are among friends or in a community of guys or girls or, or friends who is not taking responsibility for themselves and not being a positive influence in your faith, uh, be aware just of how those relationships affect you. It's been said that you are the average of your five closest relationships. Think of the five people that you are closest to in your life and ask yourself, am I okay becoming more like this person? If you're like, uh, no, I don't think so, then maybe you should find a community that encourage you, encourages you to be the type of person God has called you to be. And, and what Paul shows us here is that we all need people like Paul in our lives. We need people in our groups, in our communities that, is, that are willing to call us out, to say, hey, Brett, you have uplifted something other than the gospel to a place of prominence. Uh, the next thing we see here is this, that verse 24, it's, it's so incredible. It's, uh, Paul writes this, every group, every tribe, every community uh, is justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. And immediately, when a lot of people hear this verse, they, they get mad. Because the, the argument is, man, those Christians, they're so exclusive. Um, they, they say that you have to believe in Jesus in order to go to heaven. You have to believe that, that Jesus is the only way in order to be made right with God. Well, that's so exclusive. What about all the people who you know, spend hours each day praying, uh, you know, giving uh, alms and, and being generous to others. There's many people from other religions who are kind, who are generous, who are good, and just because they don't believe in Jesus, they don't get to be, you know, able to, to uh, go to heaven. Isn't that so exclusive? Here's our response to that. If your way of measuring who is in and who is out is just based on how good they are, how well they have behaved, 
then what about all of us who are moral failures? What about all of us who fall short? Well, what about all of us who struggle to be kind, who struggle to be generous? If that's your bar, then you have been just as exclusive as any other religion by saying there's a bar of goodness that you need to meet. And so we would say that Christianity is exclusive in the sense that there are uh, requirements in order to be made right with God, but Christianity is the most inclusive religion, belief system, way of life there is because it says the way to get into the Christian community, the way to, to participate isn't by your works, isn't by obedience, isn't by any of those things. It's just by believing in Jesus, by having faith that Jesus is uh, sufficient to cover your sins. Like, if there's, a, if there's a lower bar to get into God's community, I can't think of it. Because, Paul says, it's not something you earn. This grace is a gift. This, this grace, this access into God's community is something that you, we, we can't work for ourselves. God only gives it to us. We have to come with him with open hands. And so, yeah, there's, there's you know, some aspect of exclusivity within the Christian community, but it's the most inclusive because it says no matter where you come from, no matter what you've done, no matter where you're at, if you have faith in Jesus, you're in. You're in. And you will never get kicked out. That is inclusive. That, that is a type of community that can embrace all kinds of people. Let's uh, keep going. In verse 25, it says, Jesus was uh, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Um, if you don't know what that word propitiation is, it basically means a way to uh, deal or have wrath be satisfied. And the Bible teaches that God being absolutely committed to justice means that he is angry when injustice occurs, that he is, he, is, he is broken and angry and wrathful towards evil in this world. And again, this is, I think, another like tripping point for a lot of people. They say, you know, I have a lot of problems believing in a God of wrath. Um, I, I just can't believe, I, I don't know if I could ever worship a God who is wrathful, right? Like, that's just so barbaric, you know, aren't we in a modern world? Can't we move past that? Uh, let me say this that God's righteous wrath is critical for us to live day to day. And that God can't just sweep his wrath under the rug and say, oh, you know, just forget about my anger towards sin stuff. It's really interesting. There's a, uh, a theologian from Croatia, and uh, he talks about his struggle with this idea that God is a God of wrath. And here's what he says. You know, I used to think that wrath was unworthy of God. Isn't God love? Shouldn't divine love be beyond wrath? God is love, and God loves every person and every creature. That's exactly why God is wrathful against some of them. My last resistance to the idea of God's wrath was a causality, a casualty of the war in former Yugoslavia, the region from which I come. According to some estimates, 200,000 people were killed, and over 3 million were displaced. My villages and cities were destroyed. My people shelled, shelled day in and day out. Some of them brutalized beyond imagination. And I could not imagine God not being angry. Or think of Rwanda in the last decade of the past century where 800,000 people were hacked to death in 100 days. How did God react to that carnage? by doting on the perpetrators in a grandparently fashion, by refusing to condemn the bloodbath, but instead affirming the perpetrators' basic goodness? Wasn't God fiercely angry with them? Though I used to complain about the indecency of the idea of God's wrath, I came to think that I would have to rebel against a God who wasn't wrathful at the sight of the world's evil. God isn't wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because God is love. Do you hear what, what he's saying? He's saying, do you really want a God who acts like, you know, a grandparent does with their grandkid? 
I don't know if maybe, maybe you've seen this happen before, but, you know, there's like a small, small person causing destruction and terror in the house, and the grandfather or grandmother says, oh, man, sweetest thing in the world. Like, yeah, they, they, just, you know, they just put a hole in the wall, but, man, they're the best. Like, is that how we want God to react to the evil and suffering and injustice of this world, to basically look at these people who have committed genocide and murder and destruction and say, Oh, they're the best. You can't say that when it's your family that has been hurt. You can't say that when it's your country that's at war. You can't say that when you see the suffering around you. You can't, you can't look and say, oh, I'm, I'm glad God is, uh, you know, just, just whatever, just passive. What, what Miroslav uh, Volf is saying is that if God is really loved, then he hates when damage is done against those he loves. Communities that cry out for that justice is legit. Like, when we get hurt, it's right for us to call out, God, how long? (laughs) Let your justice roll like the rivers, as Amos says. But here's the problem. If it's only justice, if there's communities, different groups of people are fighting and injustice is done to one another, it's just going to be this cycle of destruction and revenge and revenge, one group came back at another. And this is very likely what was going to happen between the Jews and the Gentiles. Just these two groups who have hurt each, over, hurt each other over the centuries just came back to each other. Let me tell you something. Today, um, there is, a, or at least there was for a while, a, a publication, the TV show Sesame Street, right? You guys have heard of Sesame Street. And um, they wanted to take this TV show, and they wanted to air it in the Middle East. And uh, they wanted to air it in uh, modern-day Palestine, Israel, and uh, in that area. But they realized, oh, we have to change the name of it. Uh, We can't call it Sesame Street. We have to call it Sesame Stories. And the reason why they had to change it to Sesame Stories was because no one who watched the show would ever believe that Jews and non-Jews would live on the same street. That was just ridiculous in the minds of all the people who watched that show. And you, we can see that even today, there's still that animosity, still that fighting between these two groups. And Paul says justice cannot be denied. There has been hurt between these two groups, but there's a solution. And here's the, here's, here's the solution, continuing in verse 25. Jesus was put forward as this propitiation, this this atonement, this satisfaction against uh, for God's wrath against sin. And it says this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just, committed to justice, and justifier taking the people who had committed an injustice and making them right in his own eyes, in his own eyes. So this is a question. How can God be committed to justice? How can God be committed to good with at the same time being committed to us who are not good? How can God be committed and devoted to truth and still at the same time Show mercy to us who suppress the truth in our unrighteousness. How does God solve this paradox? How does God solve this problem? How can God be loving the truth and then love those who trample on the truth? And Paul says he does it through Jesus Christ and the blood he shed on the cross. There's a, there's a psalm, uh, Psalm 85, verse 10. It says, faithful love and truth will join together. Righteousness and peace will kiss. And it's a, it's a picture of these appearingly opposite values being united and being one together. And this is what Jesus did. He died on the cross to show how committed God was to justice, to the law being upheld. And he took his, uh, took his own son and made that offering But at the same time, he did it as a substitute. It wasn't his own sin. It wasn't his own fault. He did it as a substitute for those who would believe in him so that God would be just, committed to the truth, committed to righteousness, committed to what is good, 
but also the justifier of those who believe that God could offer forgiveness. God could offer redemption and life. Here's, here's Paul's application. This is, so that's the theology. This, this solution of Jesus Christ to be committed to destroying evil in the world without destroying all of us in the process was by putting forth his own son as a way to satisfy that wrath, to satisfy that commitment to justice and commitment to the law. And Paul brings up this deep theology to deal with this very real problem of conflict between these communities. And here's his application in verse 27. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. And Paul, when he says our boasting, he's, he's probably speaking about himself as a Jew. Like, fellow Jews, what becomes of our boasting? Do we boast in the law anymore? No, it is excluded. We've got nothing to brag about. We've got no reason to exalt ourselves in comparison to the Gentiles. It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Jews and non-Jews, everyone has no claim, nothing to boast on, nothing to claim before God and others saying, this is what makes us better. There's a Russian novelist. I can't pronounce his name, but I'm going to read a quote. He says, if only it were all so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the, the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. Well, Paul is saying that the, any basis that we have before God saying, that at least I'm not like that group, at least my tribe, my community does X, Y, or Z, Paul says there's nothing that we can claim. I remember um, when I was going to school in Louisville, um, I was trying to, trying to pay my way through college, and um, I heard about a um, homeless shelter, a uh, men's home and homeless shelter that basically said, hey, if you're willing to put in 15 hours a week to, uh, you know, watch the, the, the guys who are trying to work through some addictions and homelessness, uh, if you put in 15 hours a week, uh, you can stay at the homeless shelter and we'll cover, you know, obviously like room and board for you. So uh, being, being broke, I jumped in and uh, uh, stayed and lived at a homeless shelter for about two years. And um, let me tell you, I, the first six months were really a shock to me because at the time, I kind of felt like, okay, you know what, I'm pretty good. Like, how many people would live at a homeless shelter, you know, and do ministry there? Like, I kind of felt like I was part of this community that said, well, you know, there's a lot of people who are committed to the gospel, but how many of them are willing to deal with the bed bugs at this place, you know, for the sake of ministry? How many people, and we'd have to get the, what do you call it, the diatrometrious earth, fill up shoeboxes full of this stuff and put it under each of our uh, bed posts, uh, the legs of the bed, so that it kind of kept the bed bugs away. Um, like, how many people, I thought to myself, would go through all this to, to do ministry, to share the gospel with these, these homeless guys? And I was feeling pretty proud of myself. And so I would, you know, kind of interact with uh, these guys over the next six months. And I, and I said, like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm you know, glad to serve you, glad to be here. And they treated me terribly. And I was, like, so shocked because, like, surely out of all the Christians you have ever met, like, like they, you would appreciate that I'm, I'm like, living here. I'm waking up at 2 o'clock in the morning to figure out why you've set, up the, set off the alarm again. Like, surely there, there's got to be some, you know, measure of appreciation for what I'm doing here, right? And God had to teach me. He said, Brett, there's nothing you can boast about. There's nothing you can brag about um, in what you're doing because this won't justify you. And if you're looking to be impressive, if you're looking to have something to boast about, yeah, this, this doesn't cut it. And I realized that I, essentially I was, part of me was serving the uh, homeless population in Louisville just to feel better about myself and just to get some recognition. And God had to show me, Brett, if you're going to serve here, you need to serve because this, 
a good thing to do because you love me and not the approval of others, not, the, not a way to impress other Christians. And I had, I had done what, what Paul calls me not to do here, to, to boast in something before men and before God about anything I could brag about. If we become that type of community that says, man, we've got a lot of privileges, a lot of advantages, but we've got nothing to boast about. If we are a community that says, we can't look down on other communities anymore. We can't say, oh, we're better than the next community. All we can say is, but for the grace of God, there go I. We would just be in the same place as the next guy if it wasn't for God's mercy and goodness to us. And and if we embrace that, we become a type of community that is so unusual, right? Because every other community has to be built around some idea, some unifying theme or reality. Um, you know, you've got, you know, communities that are built on working out together. You know, the CrossFit community, they're kind of the crazy bunch, right? Like, they're, they're dedicated to their community. Uh, you've got communities who are dedicated to, like, World of Warcraft or communities that are dedicated to X, Y, or Z, and there's nothing wrong with being part of those communities, but there's always a level, you know, that exclusivity, right? There's that minimum bar you have to cross in order to be accepted into those communities. But if we are a community for all people, and the bar to get into our community is saying, I'll never meet the bar, only Jesus can meet the bar on my behalf, that creates a community that this world does not understand, but it will be so attractive, so unusual, so mind-blowing. Let me, let me tell you uh, one more story about Louisville. Um, doing the, the uh, homeless shelter stuff still wasn't enough to help me with my bills, so I had to get a job. And um, I worked at a restoration company. We kind of cleaned uh, like the grease off of uh, Taco Bell ceilings. And... Um, Part of, uh, it was just this small company, and the guy that I worked for, eventually he brought his son on to the crew with us. And um, he was, uh, he told me, I, I, I told him, like, hey, I'm, I'm going to school, you know, studying the Bible uh, at the Southern Baptist Seminary. And he says, oh, okay, well, I'm gay. I used to go to church, and I don't believe in Christianity anymore. I'm like, oh, okay. And we started working together, and um, it was just, <laughs> we were both broke. And so we started carpooling together. And I remember, you know, we could only clean Taco Bell after like 10 p.m. And so we got done around 1 a.m. And we carpooled back, and it was about a 45-minute drive back to Louisville. And uh, we were just kind of talking and catching up with each other about just, you know, our, our backgrounds and upbringing. And he started to share with me. Uh, we had built a relationship, and he said, you know, I, I grew up in church. I grew up, you know, going to a small church, and, um, you know, I, I eventually left the faith, and I, I'm not a Christian anymore. And I'm like, gotcha, gotcha. And, and I asked him, like, well, you know, if, um, you know, with you being, you know, public about your, your sexuality, I'm sure there's some, you know, new friendships, new communities that you've kind of entered into, right? Isn't it like the LGBT community, like, super supportive of each other? And he said, well, not really, at least not in my experience. Um, the, the thing that unifies the LGBT community is really just politics. That's, that's the only thing. And it's kind of a very shallow community. And I asked him, like, well, what do you mean it's shallow? And he said, you know, I, I do remember church. Um, and the thing that stuck out to me most about my church that um, impresses me is just the different type of people who are there. Because I think that if they didn't you know, if they weren't united by this Christian faith of theirs, those types of people would have never been friends. Those types of people would have never gotten together. The, the different, you know, people making different amounts of money, the different ethnicities, the different backgrounds, like, if they weren't all, like, united by their faith, I don't think they would have ever, like, spent time with each other. I don't think they would have ever gotten to know each other. And, you know, even though I, I don't believe in the faith that they have, um, I think that's, that's, you know, still the thing that stuck out to me most about the church. What I want to encourage us to do and to be is to be a church that defies the separations and divisions that, this, that so characterize our world. And the way we do that is by exalting this blood-bought grace that we have 
We have nothing to boast on except in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.